many times have you heard that? And I bet even for some of you, you think, yeah, I'll show them. Makes us feel good when we think the other guy is getting what's coming to them. I know for me, sadly growing up and still sometimes today, I think, yeah, that works for me. I'm going to show the other person and I'm going to feel better. I especially love it when I'm on the highway and somebody is riding my tail. And then I'm like, gosh, just go. And then that moment happens. They speed out around me and they're speeding down the highway and then you hear it and then you see it. <laughs> and the man is coming for them. And then I'm thinking to myself, yeah, you got what was coming to you. Well, I want you to contrast that to what you're going to hear today in um, Romans 12. You know, God has a different outcome in mind than we do. We're like, yeah, you get what you get coming to you. But today I want you to think of something different. Revenge is in God's hands. And what God asks us to do is overcome good with evil. It's like kill him with kindness, that kind of thing. Don't look for opportunities to get revenge. Look for opportunities to help people. You know, we're asked to live in peace. The goal is peace. Peace with God. Peace with others. In other words, kill them with kindness and leave the revenge up to God. Let's rise. And whatever happens with you, just say, you know, it's well with my soul. I'm just glad that guy didn't get hurt. If possible, to the best of your ability, live at peace with all people. Don't try to get revenge for yourselves, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. It is written, revenge belongs to me. I will pay it back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. By doing this, you will pile burning coals of fire upon his head. Don't be defeated by evil, but defeat evil with good. So, was the scene I just told about familiar or unfamiliar? You're laughing. Uh, familiar? Okay. Well, here's another scene. Uh, my friend Don Shea, who was a teacher at Oakland Mills High School, told me about an occasion that happens frequently. So you have a student kneeling by his locker, pulling out books for the next set of classes, and another student comes storming down the stairs, fearful he's going to be late, turns the corner, runs into the student, kneeling by his locker, books go flying, and words get spoken, and soon they are face to face, jaw to jaw, the anger has ramped up, and neither of them know how to step away. And, and Don, whose class is right near this incident, and is standing outside as teachers do when classes pass, sees this happening, and knows there needs to be an escape valve so that these two men, these two teenage guys, can walk away and save face. So speaking of himself, and the third person says, now if Jamal and Sean keep this up, Shay is going to have to walk in the middle of it. And if Shay walks in the middle of it, Jamal and Sean are not going to like what's happening. So if I was Jamal and Sean, I'd step away because Shay has taken the first step towards where they're standing. And of course, now, Jamal and Sean, who've been jawing at each other, kind of like, okay, if Shay's going to come here, I don't, I don't want to mess with Shay. And, and, and they back away. They have a way to get out of retaliation, where one acts and the other responds, and the other has to go one more. 
You've heard about eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. In fact, that's in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And at that time, it was an improvement on the kind of revenge that was going on. But then Jesus says, you've heard it said of old, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you to love your enemies and pray for them. How in the world is that possible? How in this world can we live at peace with all people? The expression is trite and threadbare, but it's certainly appropriate. That is easier said than done. For those of you not acquainted with our previous three messages, during this month I've been looking at chapter 12 in Romans. Paul had a request to write a manual about basic Christian teachings. What is it that followers of Jesus believe and how do those beliefs translate into everyday life? Into how we interact at our work, in our homes, in the community. And Paul's letter, which we call the Book of Romans, stressed the powerful presence of God's grace. How lives are restructured through the movement of God's grace in the world. Through cross and resurrection, we have forgiveness. We have empowerment to live our lives differently as a result. Being assured of God's love, we have no need to fear the remarks or actions of others, but instead of being on guard, ready to get even, we can respond in kindness. In week one, we dealt with what this declaration, I implore you by God's mercy to present yourselves as a living, holy, acceptable sacrifice to God. We live our God lives according to God's will. And the verb there, present, you might remember, means that what you did in the past, that you're doing right now, continue to do in the future. It's a, it's a verb tense we don't have in English called aorist. A tense of continuing love in action as we present ourselves to God, as our act of spiritual worship. And then he continues, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds, that by testing you might discern what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That, that God has a preferred and promised future for our lives, for our congregation, for the Christian movement in the world. And by being attentive to God's word and the movement of God's spirit, we can discern what that will is. In week two, we talked about how every follower of Jesus has a particular gift, ability, insight to enhance the community of faith. And then last week, we considered the nitty-gritty expressions of love, that, that love isn't just a feeling, but it deals with the irritations and the challenges and the problems in life. And that this love that comes to us daily in the assurance that we are people who are valued by God, that, that this love then can take an expression through us 
individually and as congregation in our mission in the world. And today we continue this conversation about what difference does it make if our life is structured by grace as Paul says, live at peace, not only with people we find agreeable, but also and especially with persons we might find repugnant. Now, living at peace is what Jesus modeled and taught. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, happy are the people who, who are peacemakers. They're called the children of God. And later he said, you've heard it was said, you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. Love your enemies. And pray for those who harass you. In, in the science fiction movie, Ender's Game, there's this profound line. By the way, the author, Oscar Card Scott, is, is um, a Mormon, of, a man of great faith. And in his science fiction writings, he always brings into the conversation spiritual insights. And in, in Ender's Game, there's this powerful scene where the youth is told this. You cannot truly understand your foe until you love him. And that gets played out in the next six volumes of this series. But you have to understand your foe to the point of loving him. And what gets unstated, but told through the story, through the drama, is at the point of truly understanding your foe, he no longer is your foe. Luke. Jesus said, when you enter a house, when you come to the stranger, you say, peace be to this house. And John, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I give to you not only as the world gives. Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. And then later, as the church movement begins, he wrote to, Paul wrote to the Roman Christians, since we are made right with God through Jesus, we have peace with God. And then in Ephesians, Christ is our peace. He made both Jew and Gentile different races of people, different ethnicities. He made Jews and Gentiles into one group with his body he broke down the barriers of hatred that divide, divide us. When one's life is structured by grace, we can live as ambassadors of God's peace. Coincidentally, this week, or maybe God incidentally, David Brooks' essay on Friday addressed this issue. He addressed the different cultural influences coming from what he calls the stories from Athens and the stories from Jerusalem, and how each injects differing values into ethics, the arts, government policy, pressing social issues, international relationships, and how you and I act and interact every day with the people who cross our path. Athens, as Brooks described, stands for competitive virtues, strength, toughness, prowess, righteous indignation, the capacity to smite your foes and win eternal fame. Think of the warrior. 
of Hercules, of Achilles. Jerusalem stands for cooperative virtues, humility, love, faithfulness, patience, grace, mercy, forgiveness, answering a harsh word with a gentle response. Think of Moses and Jesus. And the stories that, that extol the competitive virtues use a form of narration called myth. Myths usually happen in a, in a different world where there is great peril. And, and the world is not quite identified in time and history. It's like the Star Wars preface. And, and what's that line? Uh, oh, come on, you know it, don't you? Those, those opening words? A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. In this other perilous world, there's great danger. Many of the mythic myths of recent days, appealing to the teenage audience, are set in dystopian times, which means a places where conditions are really bad, where there's been degradation because of war or pestilence or disease. Myths attract us, says Brooks, because they appeal to our desire, our hunger, to do something heroic. So we identify, whether it's Zeus, or Wonder Woman, or the X-Men, or Luke Skywalker, or Katniss Everdeen, or T'Challa, the Black Panther. Or for others in this room who have no idea what I'm talking about, think of Matt Dillon, the Rifleman, or Davy Crockett. <laughs> Through their stories, we are joined to the heroic quest, the fateful combat. The drama is external and action-oriented. Differing from myths are the stories that highlight compassionate virtues, the parables, set in ordinary times with people who are just like us. As we listen to those stories, we, we go inside ourselves and rehearse our own. The examples are the parables Jesus told of the Good Samaritan, where you have the foreigner caring to the man who was beaten up and left to die, or, or the story of the prodigal son who ran away with his, and spent his father's money and the gracious father and the jealous older brother. And these stories bring us to the moral dilemma, the occasion where a key question is brought to, for our pondering of whether we will or not express charity and faithfulness and forgiveness and love. And as Brooke went on to observe right now, and I was talking with someone before church this morning, right now our society is inundated with myth. In fact, so much so that competitive values have effectively displaced our ability as a society to ponder, to hold dialogue, to come together in humility, to discover a better way for all people. We don't know how to get along with each other. For me, and I trust for you also, the better way happens when we present ourselves to God again and again and again, surrendering self-will to discover God's will. That's how we discern and understand God's preferred and promised future.
but according to the metrics of viewership and the income generated, the mythic enterprise of movies and video games and sports command billions of dollars in immense viewership. Vic, I didn't know. Did you realize there is a worldwide competition of video games? The League of Legends? And, and you can watch it on your computer? And, and, and when the mid-year competition took place, there were over 360 million people online watching this competition. Three times the viewership for the Super Bowl. Yes, in sports. The living myth that gives people the sense of heroic. I'm watching the World Cup. I'm a sports fan. And, and, and the storyline is so dramatic of the goal being scored in the 95th minute or the player who makes the fatal mistake that causes the downfall of the team. And just like a superhero movie or video game comment, viewers of the sporting event for a moment suspend disbelief as if whoever puts the ball in the net matters. But the problem happens is we really believe it does matter. And we get sucked into that attitude for living our lives. Please hear me on this point. Sports, video games, and movies portraying heroes are not bad per se. They provide a lot of fun entertainment. But when they supplant our ability to enter into spiritual reflection, or when competitive virtues so command public life that we look upon certain people as either having no value or become objects for us to manipulate for our own gain, then moral poverty has infected us. Being a student of history, I know what happens when a society so takes hold of competitive virtues that they exclude from the public square people not like them. And the road towards becoming exclusionary often confuses retaliation and name-calling and personal insults as signs of strength or virility. But as history shows us, they're really signs of social poverty. And again, quoting from Brooks, when societies fully embrace competitive virtues and stand upon the heroic myth, they can tend to give short shrift to relationships and see life as an eternal competition between warring hearts, warring tribes. They tend to see the line between good and evil as running between groups of people and not, as in the parable, running between every person's heart. Paul says, that along with saying, I believe, we are to present ourselves humbly before a good and gracious God. Today, tonight, every moment. So that our lives will instead be structured by grace. And then we can endeavor to live at peace with all people. Let us pray. Lord, I, I, I find the times in which we live perilous. Because whether it's a Facebook posting or an argument between neighbors or world leaders, we don't know how to get along. We don't know how to find the common wheel that you desire for all humanity. 
Lord, your son showed us the way. As he said, he is the way, the truth, the life. Help us to pause in the moment we feel the anger flushing our face with red to inhale the breath of the Spirit and to practice the way of peace. For Jesus' sake, amen.